Hey everyone, welcome back to the 443 Security Simplified. I'm your host, Mark the Liberty, and joining me today is... Corey, apparently the caveman, not Griner. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I'm the one that is actually at WatchGuard HQ right now with this super fancy microphone that probably costs more than my car. Uh, and Corey is nice still sitting one. at home. And, you know, I flew into the office specifically to record this podcast, Corey, and you couldn't even be bothered to show up. I figured I would come see it tomorrow. But to be, be we fair, our, we had a meeting today that started at 6 a.m. and it takes me an hour and a half to get there. I commuted here uh, from I'm not going to wake up. So no you, you stayed overnight in a fancy hotel that was probably a nice five minute walk away. That's, I don't, I, not throwing shade at Marriott, but the courtyard in Pioneer Square is about as far from a fancy hotel as you can possibly get. <laughs> okay. uh, anyways, Still a seven minute walk though. Yes, it was a nice seven minute walk. On today's cybersecurity podcast, uh, we are not discussing hotels. Uh, we are discussing the White House executive order on artificial intelligence. Uh, we'll go into a story on why Corey should be afraid for his job and potentially ending in prison. We will <laughs> go over a new scoring Thanks. system yep, for vulnerabilities and some research into potentially the end of encryption as we know it. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and entangle yeah. our way in. Quantum and that was a stretch. Man. I think Biden found you out, man, now that he, he knows that artificial intelligence is messed up. Yep, he's on to us. So this week, start with our first story, uh, which was, you know, I, I'm going to admit, I wrote this one off when I first saw it. Uh, before yeah, we get into it, I, I told you about it, and you immediately wrote it off on the call. I told you about it in front of everyone, and then it's like yeah. the first story you put on your list. By the way, I will I, write it off at the end of this for one reason, but uh, not the same reason as yours. But let's fair. hear this so, story. To your credit, Corey, uh, the topic itself and the the source of this story made me think, okay, it's dumb, and there's nothing's going to come of it. But you know. After I took the time to actually read what was going on, I think there's some some meat to this. So uh, as we're kind of beating around the bush for wow, our first you story, think that this this uh, this source is dumb. My goodness, I, you know You've what? Been in I'm not afraid for a to while. say <laughs> the, the source is the federal government, and regardless of politics, there tends to be some dumb stuff coming out of it in the world of technology from time to time. This is the guy doing a million CISO White House executive order, uh, NSA and FBI stories in the last hundred podcasts we've had. The federal government CISA sucks. is the exception, CISA. not the rule. <laughs> but OK, let's actually roll with what we wanted to talk about. And that is an executive order coming from the White House titled Executive Order on the Safe, Secure, and Trustworthy Development and Use of Artificial Intelligence. So I think you can just based off the title understand why my first thought was this is going to just be a whole bunch of hot air coming out of it. Um, but man, the order is, if, the, if you were to copy paste this new Word document, it would probably be on the order of like 30 or 40 pages or so. It's absolutely nuts how much they've crammed into this giant, publication from the White House. And it kind of starts, it's broken down into a few sections, and it starts by just defining and laying out you know, the understanding that uh, artificial intelligence is here to stay. It can solve a lot of really big challenges. Uh, it has legitimate good uses, but irresponsible use for it could create and exasperate existing issues in society. And so the purpose of this executive order is to address that and make sure that as we are rolling out this rapidly evolving technology and developing it, there's some like guardrails around it to try and keep it from becoming Skynet and ending humanity at the extreme end. But at the minimum end from having it uh, affect, you know, biases and um, issues with certain classes of citizens that, you know, there's a real risk that this type of technology could be used as a crutch by technology, by organizations and cause issues in our society. Happened before with other technologies. We even one of our researchers, yeah, facial recognition is not the same as AI, although maybe it is because facial recognition, uh, probably uses, you know, statistics to look at different <laughs> aspects of of a face to create the 
whatever token it uses that it authenticates. But anyways, we've seen other technologies used for security that have bias in them, uh, just based on the training data used when they first made the technology. So yep. you just brought up bias as one of the issues, definitely one that should be talked about more in AI. So the, uh, the quote that kind of stood out to me in the first couple paragraphs was, uh, quote, my administration places the highest urgency on governing the development and use of AI safety and responsibility uh, and is therefore advancing a coordinated federal government wide approach to doing so. So I like this isn't the first person or the first organization to say, hey, maybe we're moving things a little too quickly. And are people considering the safety and privacy and societal ramifications? And this seems to be the White House uh, recognizing that and attempting to do something. Now, to be fair, it's not the first time the government talked. Oh, we went to Black Hat and AI was the theme. And Black Hat, right during the keynote, invited uh, US federal government related speakers whose topics were AI. And then at DEF CON is where I saw the DOD's, you know, master of AI talk about it. So it feels like it's just finally the head of the snake catching up with what a lot of uh, other government agencies have been talking about for sure. The, the one unfortunate thing before we dive into the details of this is it's coming as a executive order, which if you're not familiar with US politics, this is basically the, the White House, the federal government trying to mandate rules or enforcement or something. And while they do have some leeway through like federal government agencies, especially when it comes to private companies that work on federal contracts, uh, they're a, like this is all at the whim of the current person residing in the Oval Office. And so like the next president that comes through can just straight up delete it entirely from existence or modify it without going through, you know, congressional review or anything like that. So it's a bit of a flimsy ground, but in this case, it's at least like- I, I will say that timelines. was why you downplayed it when I first told you, but it actually executive orders do invoke the Defense Production Act. And one of the teeth in doing this does mean that uh, the federal government can actually, with the Defense Production Act, force companies to share some results of the risk and assessment. So I, I, I am often the one that kind of poo-poos executive orders too, so I get it, uh, because I feel like they don't have teeth until their bills. But I will say that Defense of Production Act a bit does mean that companies may have to react to this. And certainly, you're right, it's not regulated. They may not have to do anything, but they may have to share results, do risk assessment, respond to some of the government's questioning. I also yeah. will point out, and we can talk about this later, there are senators that are already proposing the bill. So, wow. Uh, uh, you know, two senators in particular, Mark Warner, uh, by the way, also cross-partisan, and Mark Warner's a Democrat in Virginia, I guess, and Senator Jerry Moran, who's a Republican in Kansas. So, wow, I, I, I think you and I probably have the same opinion of executive orders being kind of low usually and no hope that the Congress will do anything actual real, but maybe cybersecurity is the exception because it looks like they're starting to act already. It does seem like the ball is rolling. Uh, so in the executive order, they've got two other main sections. First, they lay out kind of the guiding policies and principles that the White House is dictating down to executive departments and agencies. Um, it's They've got a few like call them like pillars or tenets that uh, are the framework for the actual requirements and actions that come a little later in the report. Uh, they've got a few buckets. So they start with, first off, AI must be safe and secure, basically saying the administration is going to help develop a effective labeling mechanism so that us as AI consumers uh, or even just consumers of content or stuff on the internet can know whether something has been determined uh, created by an AI model or if it's been created by a human, which I think is kind of important. This doesn't like cause any undue harm. Like it doesn't make it harder to use AI, but it means the content that gets put out from a consumer side, like we know the difference and that might make it a little safer for us. Um, so I like that one. It feels like minimum effort. Um, they're also promoting responsible innovation, uh, competition and collaboration to unlock AI's potential which basically boils down to the government's proposing projects similar to the AI Grand Challenge that they announced at DEF CON this year, uh, where they're going to try and fuel with federal money 
uh, innovation in the world of artificial intelligence. And this makes sense because I, th I think we all at this point recognize the cat's out of the bag and there are actually a lot more uses for especially some of these very powerful generative AI models uh, all over. And we probably haven't discovered all the uses yet. So the US is historically a on the forefront of science and technology and it's nice to see the federal government saying, hey, we're going to fund that to make sure that we are the leaders in uh, developing this technology. Um, they, another bullet was AI development uh, must support American workers. Administration will seek to adopt uh, job training and education to support a diverse workforce. And then they're also explicitly saying they don't want AI to be used in any way that might undermine the rights or worsen job quality. They, they don't go so far as to say, you know, we're worried about stealing jobs and stuff, but they don't want like companies to use AI in a way that harms workforces, harms labor practices, harms labor relations. It's good seeing that written out in writing, I guess. Um, they have a tenant in here where AI policies must ensure equality and civil rights. Basically, they don't want to, they will not tolerate the use of AI uh, to disadvantage already disadvantaged classes. You can think of this, they call out later on like a few specific areas like housing or healthcare or financial services or education where, you know, we have laws protecting access to a lot of this. And if you suddenly say, oh, well, no, it's the AI model that made this decision and you can't explain why it did that and maybe it was biased in some way, they're not going to let that slide as an excuse for organizations that are using AI. Um, and then I think two other ones I wanted to highlight. They specifically men mentioned privacy must be at the forefront. So making sure that the collection and use and retention of data is laudful and secure. And then administration will take steps to attract AI professionals to assist with developing governance and regulations. So they recognize we're going to need some laws on the books. And they are explicitly saying they intend to find folks that know what they're talking about to help design those laws, which is a nice breath of fresh air. So after laying out these policies and kind of guidelines, they then go into a extremely long section laying out actual action items that they're proposing. And it basically boils down to like using the various appendages of the federal government, all the agencies from NIST to CISA to the Secretary of Energy, and in whatever area they control, giving them sort of a requirement for deliverables when it comes to AI safety and development and usage in the areas that they oversee. Like as an example, they're calling on NIST within the next 270 days to establish guidelines and best practices for developing and deploying AI. Uh, they want them to uh, ad add a basically an addendum to the secure software development framework that's specifically about AI. They want an addendum to or an, a companion resource to their existing AI risk management framework, uh, which is NIST AI 100-1, specifically for generative AI. Um, and then using those standards, they're going to go out to federal civilian executive branches and then require organizations that work with the government and just governmental organizations in general to follow these standards. Uh, a few other ones, they call on the Secretary of Energy, like I mentioned, uh, to just basically consider the use of AI and the risks of use in AI in the energy sector, with things like nuclear, biological, chemical, and critical infrastructure. They've got a pretty short timeline of 90 days for the Secretary of Commerce under the uh, Defense Productions Act, like you mentioned, Corey, uh, to come up with uh, requirements around federal government contractors and those in the defense industrial base for things like disclosing how they're using artificial intelligence, describing the cybersecurity steps they're taking to protect their artificial intelligence deployment, um, the results of any model uh, performance in AI red, te red team testing uh, in line with NIST's requirements. Um, so, like, it's honestly, like, I was kind of surprised. I know. Joe Biden didn't write this himself. He had experts okay. and staffers write this, but it's actually pretty dang thorough. Some of their ideas they're, they're throwing out there. They even went so far as to like put down requirements around like if your computing power for your AI training model surpasses a certain threshold of 10 to the 23 integer or point uh, floating point operations, then you're under this new level of requirements for reporting and security. Like they went pretty in depth in this with 
I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I imagine within the framework of what they're allowed to do in an executive order. Can we, we talk about the funny thing? Because you mentioned Joe Biden didn't write this, and I agree with you. It's a pretty deep executive order. It's stuff that all these, I, I bet you advisors have wanted and thought about this for a long time, and that's why it's so big. But the one thing you didn't put in your notes is the fact that apparently Biden got a screening of the Mission Impossible movie, <laughs> uh, and it uh, its big baddie is AI. And apparently this is kind of what suddenly drove Biden <laughs> to push with the uh, the new uh, executive order. So it, it kind of is funny how this started, despite the fact that I think you and I think it's much needed. And luckily, the White House team and, and all the departments involved already had a plan. You know what? I'm for it. If this is the way an 80 something year old dude decides that maybe we have an issue we need to address. Yeah. I'll take my win when we get it. <laughs> Absolutely. That, I think media, I mean, the reason you and I do videos and joke, I, I, and I, we loved uh, uh, Mr. Robot is I think media, even fictional media can sometimes inform people. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I'm actually remembering this. I think you shared this with our team, that story. Basically, he saw the movie and then went back and said, is any of this like real or potential reality? And apparently it scared him enough to really push forward with this uh, executive order trying to address some of our concerns and make sure that we are doing things securely. I wonder so if he ever went lines... back and watched the the old movie, The Nets, uh, and maybe he'll rethink the Patriot Act after seeing And Anyways, sorry. <laughs> I don't think that the Patriot Act is going to be going anywhere, Corey. I'm sorry to say it. <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, but anyways, there are some pretty aggressive timelines on this. Like we should start seeing some work come out of it on the order of 90 days and 270 days at most from uh, a lot of these organizations. I, for one, am looking forward to seeing NIST's contributions and their standards and recommendations, um, and especially with their updates to things like the secure software development framework. So I think, you know, this isn't solving AI and this is by no means going to be like, oh, now we're done, everything's secure. But it does at least get the ball rolling with organizations that have to work with the federal government, which is quite a lot. And I think it will at least help figure out you know, what might work and what might not work when it comes to trying to allow AI development and use effectively unrestrained, well, with a little bit of a restraint on making sure we maintain security and privacy. So... I guess that's my long-winded way of saying, Corey, you're right. This was a kind of interesting story, and I am sorry for writing it off the instant I saw the title of it because I thought it was going to be super dumb. <laughs> um, so moving on to a story very topical for uh, Corey himself here. Uh, the SEC just announced that they had filed charges against SolarWinds and specifically their chief information security officer, Tim Brown, last week with fraud and internal control failures relating to the 2020 supply chain attack that involved the SolarWinds Orion platform. Uh, so the issue that the SEC is describing is a discrepancy between what uh, CISO, Tim Brown, uh, and other SolarWinds employees were saying internally in messages versus what they were disclosing to investors. So if you're not familiar with the SEC, the Security Exchange Commission, like they come in when they feel like you are screwing around your investors. So if it is costing investors money in a publicly traded company, that's where they come into the fold. It is kind of funny how some of this action on in the world of cybersecurity is really boiled down to shareholders got hurt and not like, you know, gross negligence potentially with security practices just in general, but whatever. Yeah, yeah they're mad so, that their stock went down probably only temporarily exactly. too. So they said internal messages revealed that employees were well aware that they were misleading customers in the wake of the discovery of the Orion vulnerabilities. There's a quote in here where it says, shortly after October 2020, the October 2020 attack against the cybersecurity firm uh, B, so unnamed firm B, SolarWinds employees, including Brown, recognized similarities between the attack on U.S. government agency A. The SEC complaint said, uh, but when personnel at cybersecurity firm B asked SolarWinds employees if they had previously seen similar activities. Uh, InfoSec employee F falsely told the cybersecurity firm B that they had not. He then messaged a colleague saying, quote, well, I just lied. 
So I think we, I, you and I. By the way, is B Mandiant? I yes, a B <laughs> has got to be Mandiant in this situation. <laughs> and you know, if you're going to try lying to a company, I feel like lying to Mandiant is probably not the yeah. best option because they are the pros at figuring things. Especially out. if, by the way, you brought them in to help. I mean, isn't the whole point to share everything uh, you have about it? So in this one, it was Mandiant oh, got nailed. A, They're the ones that nailed. actually discovered the breach because they were using yeah. Orion. And they discover the activity uh, yeah, after you what was it an MFA that. token got yeah, added Fire to the user's eye, which, are, yeah. which is Mandiant, right? So, yeah, no, no, I remember now. <laughs> e either way, I, I don't think Lion is a good thing that for any CISO. I, I mean, no. uh, I, I have some caveats. I, we should talk about uh, security questionnaires and kind of the later on. Sometimes when you're responding to questionnaires, answers like there is no single one word answer to 90% of what do you do to secure XYZ. It's usually a complicated answer, but either way, line is not something you should ever do. Whether, whether you're doing something like literally covered by the SEC that, you know, <laughs> actually you have to legally answer truthfully, or if you're just doing a security questionnaire to somebody, but we'll get to that. Let, yeah, so I mean, the last bits of their complaint was that uh, so Brown was aware but ignored warnings about the company's vulnerabilities, including a 2018 presentation by an unnamed SolarWinds engineer that flagged the company's remote access setup as, quote, not very secure and explained a threat actor could use it to, quote, basically do whatever without us detecting it until it's too late. And that by ignoring these warnings about its cybersecurity posture, the company uh, and uh, the cybersecurity posture. Uh, they failed to raise the issue up to the chain of command. The SEC alleges that Brown willfully left the company's systems unprotected. And then the way that the SEC came involved is they're accusing him of benefiting from this by selling stock at what's was then inflated stock prices in December 2020, basically saying, you know, this is after the incident. If the world knew the full breadth of it, your share price would have been significantly lower. But because he didn't tell the world about it, your share price was uh, artificially inflated and you benefited from that by selling stock. And they also accused him of selling shares between February 2020 and August 2020 uh, before its value plummeted once the full impact of it became public. So that's where the SEC comes into this. You cost investors. I, I think it's good to mention that detail, though, because a lot of CISOs like uh, there's already a a a great resignation. I, I think we've seen Gartner's predictions about a huge decrease in security professionals in general, including half of the CISOs leaving positions, or as 25% of CISOs are leaving, and then 50% of those are going outside. Half the are industry, leaving, I think. Half of those are just leaving entirely. Yeah. But I, I, to me, if you're a normal CISO, you shouldn't be too. I mean, don't lie just don't lie legal <laughs> things and then and don't like shadily sell all your stock when you have insider information i mean it, to me it it there's probably some security ne negligence here in the line i think ignoring remote right now remote is like number one thing insurers are going to ask you do you have mfa on remote access tell us about your remote access if you follow us you know vpn ssh we made predictions about remote access it's it's the way bad guys get in with credentials so that is maybe negligent but the thing that's really getting him in trouble isn't necessarily the fact that the controls were bad it was that he lied about them and he did a little what seems like insider trading. Yep. So I think that's basically it. Like at the end of the like, day, like if he told the truth, had... if, if, if he had told his executives that a remote access was bad, but resource caused them to refuse to fix it, if he had mentioned as a little thing, or, you know, here's what we do for security, here is our weakness, would this still be an issue despite them still having the breach and still having crappy remote access negligence? You know, maybe it wouldn't have gone to court at all, even though technically they still had the potentially not perfect practice. Yeah, I think that's absolutely on the ball. Like basically it boils down to don't be a jerk and don't lie when you uh, are, especially in like legal filings and when dealing with as a publicly traded company under scrutiny of the SEC. So uh, it, it, they're similar, I think. The last one was what the CISO of um, 
Uber. Uber. That ended up getting the book thrown at him because they were intentionally covering up the cyber breach, what you are not allowed to do. Even talking with the hackers, if I remember right. Exactly. Yeah. So it's still like all of these, these major instances where, you know, everyone goes, oh, CISOs are under, you know, attack now. It's CISOs that are arguably being fraudulent with their role. And yeah. I think that is where the line gets drawn. Now, now to be honest, it, it is showing that sea levels can suffer, com- you know, issues if you break the law. <laughs> so, Good. I mean, sea so <laughs> exactly. I mean, that, that that should be for anyone that breaks the law. So I, I do think there is true that CISOs need to realize they are accountable. And when there's things like legal requirements and compliance and regulation, you are legally compliant. So there's CISOs do need to have their eyes wide open about what they're accountable for. But I, I absolutely agree that it it shouldn't scare you that much, though, if you just you don't even I, I mean, I think all of us suffer resource issues, uh, and I, that's one of the things the articles talk about. Is you know, the CSOs have a hard time getting the resource they need to get the security they want. But as long as you're truthful and open about you know your security, what you're trying to do to make it better, whether you're getting there fast or not, you know, you're not going to get into legal trouble. I don't think so for trying to do the right thing but not having the resource. You're and if you do, at least you'll have a sound line. defense as yeah. opposed to a defense where you literally have intercompany text messages saying, I just lied. I just lied. Yeah, that's if you ever say that, that's a problem. Yep. Uh, so uh, moving on then. Unless, well, maybe before you, you do, the one other thing I did want to talk about where this is hard, though, is I do think we need to one of the places that CSOs everywhere are probably getting hammered is with vendor validation and third party risk management. And I think we've talked about it's a good thing for you to know what your key vendors are doing about their cybersecurity. So you should be asking those questions. But one of the biggest irritations I think every department has when we get these questions are they're questions like, do you patch? And of course the answer is yes. But the, and, and it might even be a complex answer where we have automated patch management that does this scan every five weeks. We do, you know, you know, there could be really complex answers to that. But ultimately, if you were asked the question of, are all your servers always 100% patched with no end of life projects? you know, end of life products. I I bet you few CSOs could ever answer yes to that, even if they have a really good patching cycle. So the issue I think about when I think about the, I mean, this guy said he just lied, so it may be a different thing, but I think about answering security questionnaires that are basically saying, we want this to be a yes or a no. And the con, like, do you back up? Well, I have 500 different types of data and the backup requirements and SLAs for all of them are different. So I, what I would hate to see happen is very generic questions that come out uh, as the things we're grading each other's security on, which are going to get very generic answers. But then considering one of those answers, like, like if, if it turns out you say, yes, I patch, but your vulnerability was you had an end of life server for the past six months. But it's one you knew about because you had to keep it for a business reason. So, you know what I mean? That kind of stuff. I don't want them to go back and think, yeah, I I just feel like it. you have to be very careful about the questions. And I guess the second thing is I'm proud of our security at WatchGuard. You know, when people say, do you pat, I, I get excited about our vulnerability assessment and stuff like that. But I feel like even though I'm proud, I think Mark and I know there's lots of things we want to approve, lots of little things. So the other maybe warning is maybe we can't be so optimistic even when we think we're doing a decent job compared to others, because it seems just being optimistic about your security, even when you know there's lots of opportunities for improvement, could get you into dangerous water and have people think you might be lying. (laughs) I see what you're saying. I think that is the line, though, is you can be optimistic. Just don't falsely represent. Just don't say you're you're actually perfect. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Like as long as you're realistic and representing where you are currently at and, you know, you can be proud of that. Just don't say, oh, yeah, we are 100 percent patched everywhere. And we always have been. Yeah, 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 don't say that. You aren't. Yeah. 
honestly, um, if you just do something simple, like because you maybe you had to get some sort of compliance and you adopted a formal security framework like ISMS for ISO or pick any other framework out there you want, you probably have something like a risk register anyways internally where you, you do know all your risks. So if you ever were brought you know those type that that type of documentation that governance which seems like a pain in the butt of you know saying yes to where you're doing good but also formally writing down the risks whether you accept them or not you know maybe some of these risks are accepted even and you're never going to fix them but having that it would also help you if anything came to court like this where you were being told you know someone thought you were misrepresenting something so Corey's uh, main takeaway is if you've got a mature cybersecurity program, you're okay. If you've got yeah. a crappy cybersecurity program and you lie about it, you're not okay. Probably that, that I think that's it. That's probably it. Yep. Um, so moving on to the next topic, uh, this is one I was actually really excited to see come down the line. Uh, so the organization uh, first.org just published the new Common Vulnerability Scoring System, or CVSS version 4.0. Now, if you're not familiar with CVSS, it's our way of grading on a scale of 0.0, .0 to 10.0, the severity of a vulnerability. Um, now, pausing for a second, first is the first one to admit, that's funny, uh, that this is grading the severity, not the actual risk around the vulnerability. There are other factors that come into play once you understand the severity, like the maturity of the exploit code, your ability to mitigate, all of that. But we need at least some grading system to say, on a scale of 0 to 10, how potentially bad is this particular issue? And so we've been using the 3.1 scoring system for quite a few years now. Um, and this is the first really big overhaul in quite some time. And I've gone through it, and I'm actually I'm pretty happy with a lot of the changes they've added uh, that we'll go through here in a second, uh, because it solves quite a few of the the issues and kind of misrepresentations about the CVSS scoring system and how it has been used in the past. Um, so, and if you're not familiar with CVSS, basically you've got different uh, vectors as they're they're called, different like settings that you can put it in the calculator. Uh, so like, how is the vulnerability exploited? Is it over a local only or through a network? Um, what is the impact to confidentiality, integrity, or availability? And all these different like options with different weights ultimately percolate up to this 0.0, .0 .0 to 10.0 score. Um, so when it comes to the changes uh, for CVSS 4.0 versus 3.1, there's a couple of big ones. First one is just all about nomenclature, so how they actually call these different scoring systems. You've got what is the base metrics, which if you fill in just the required fields in a calculator, you'll get a 0 0.10 score, but that doesn't always tell all of the picture. And so they've got as well now a base and environmental metric. So based off the environment where the vulnerability resides in, how can that influence the severity of it? The threat metrics, so based off the opportunity to exploit the vulnerability, how could that affect it? And the combination of that, so base threat and environmental metrics. And in their More acronyms, is, yay. Exactly. In their acronyms, they say the numerical CVSS score, uh, the scores have very different meanings based on the metrics used to calculate them. Uh, regarding prioritization, the usefulness of the numerical CVSS score is directly proportional to the CVSS metrics leveraged to generate the score. Therefore, numerical CVSS scores should be enumerated uh, using nomenclature that communicates the metrics used in its generation. So that was a lot of words. What they're saying is historically, we would say this is a CVSS 9.8 or this is a CVSS 10.0. And that's all we left it as. We didn't tell you like what were the what was the suite or the amount of metrics we used in order to calculate that score. We just gave you a number saying this is CVSS. Their new requirements are or their strong guidance is that whenever you're giving a numerical value, uh, you should use this nomenclature to uh, display how it was actually generated. So is it CVSS-B, so just the base metric, nothing else? Is it CVSS-BE, so base and environmental, so dash BT or dash BTE? So that as you're reading it, instead of just getting 9.0, you understand, okay, it's 9.0, and we took into account like the potential environment and the threats to it when we came up with that score. 
So maybe it's a bit of a more meaningful 9.0 than it, if we had just used the base scoring metrics. I like this change. It's a pretty small one. It's just how we advertise now vulnerabilities. And it just gives you, on the face of it, a little bit more understanding of how in-depth did they go into grading it um, and like the credibility to the actual score. It's nice. Um, they also added some more granularity uh, to that actual base metric with new metrics and new values. Uh, so, for example, uh, there used to be in 3.1 a metric called attack complexity, and that was just it. So either low or high. This is basically, you know, it's considered low complexity if in general it works every time. It could be high complexity if it's like a buffer overflow where you have to properly paint like the, the memory location. Uh, and it could change depending on each time you try and exploit it. Did they have a good definitions for low, medium, high? Because I, I mean, the problem with that obviously is it becomes subjective. Like yep. uh, if you know it just takes a simple URL change and it's remote, you might say low complexity for sure. But uh, maybe there's other, ca you know what I mean? I, if you're really good at, at understanding, you know, how much user interaction or whether things are remote or things are exposed, you, you're, you're probably OK at that subjective judgment. But it's it is mm -hmm. so subjective. So I assume the new way is less subjective. So they had uh, like paragraphs for each describing either low or high. Those were your only two options. And what they're doing uh -huh. in this new one is they're actually splitting attack complexity into attack complexity and now attack requirements as well too. And the differences between those are for complexity, it reflects the uh, exploit engineering complexity required to evade or circumvent defenses. Basically, how difficult is it to attack this specific vulnerability on a system that is vulnerable? And then the uh, attack requirements is the prerequisite conditions of the vulnerable components that make the attack possible. So like is there does it need ASLR off on the host in order yeah, to be able so to I, I was about to say something like a, a a stack buffer overflow that takes one packet on a service that's always exposed seems like it's very low complexity but it's yep. a memory corruption vulnerability so if you have dep ASLR uh, defenders memory protections turned on even though it's a super easy buffer overflow to exploit actually doing anything from it may be near impossible without additional vulnerabilities to get past those those so I think that's, that's a it sounds great like what description it's doing. Yeah. of attack complexity versus requirements it might be easy to exploit but in order to do it successfully it's going to depend on the actual system so i like that they're splitting that out to give a little more granularity instead of just a low or high for complexity and that's it um they also replace the concept of scope as a metric uh, with now the concepts of vulnerable system and subsequent system. And actually, so I really like this because when I tried to explain internally to like our PCERT team during trainings, for like new employees or new members of the team, trying to explain the scope metric was always a little bit difficult to, for me at least, to explain in a way that was easy to wrap people's heads around. But it's basically, it used to boil down to, uh, the, so the vulnerability exists in a component in a system. And if you exploit the vulnerability, is the effect of that isolated to just that component? Or can it go outside of the scope and affect the entire system? Um, so for an example, like a vulnerability in the authentication form, I guess it could give you authentication, but could it give you like access to the entirety of the system, I guess. Um, so they're getting rid of the scope metric entirely. And now when it comes to the impact metrics, which used to just be impact to confidentiality, impact to availability, or impact to integrity, they've split each of those into two. Um, so for the um, the system, or shoot, what the heck is it called? The vulnerable system, what is the impact to confidentiality, integrity, and availability? And to subsequent systems, what is the potential impact? So if you do exploit it, what's the impact to just the thing with the issue or everything else within the, the actual component? And I think having that a little bit more nuanced or granularity uh, will help folks understand like, you know, this is a very serious issue, but it's isolated to just this one little bit of this one little application. And there's actually walls protecting the rest of the application from you exploiting it versus if you exploit this, the entire system is totally hosed. So it's good. Um, they also are improving the user interaction um, metric. So it used to be user interaction was required or not required. 
Uh, now they're adding splitting it so it's either passive or so none, passive or active. So splitting the user interaction required into passive interaction or active interaction. Passive is basically it's limited interaction. Like if you trick someone into clicking a link and they go to a website and that allows you to exploit the issue, uh, that would be considered a passive interaction. Whereas active requires some specific conscious interaction, like you need to trick the user into doing these sets of actions in order to trigger that vulnerability exploit. So have, having that additional granularity versus just user interaction or no user interaction, I think is a pretty good change as well. Um, they then renamed, so there's the temporal metric group. This has been renamed to the threat metric group, which currently just includes a metric for the exploit maturity. So the vulnerability exists. This is a way for whoever's grading the vulnerability to note whether exploit code is available or not. And like, how mature is that code? Can I go on to GitHub and get the proof of concept and easily exploit everyone on the internet with it? Or do I have to go develop my own specific vulnerability or exploit for specific systems? Or is it a theoretical vulnerability that no exploit currently exists out in the wild for? These are all important factors. Um, and then finally, there's a new supplemental metric group uh, for just additional attributes around the vulnerability. So as an example, there's one in here called safety. So if the system is a part of something that could harm, let's say, human life, and the vulnerability uh, was exploited, like that's a factor that you should really take into consideration. Uh, can the attack be automated against multiple systems easily? That's a new metric they track as well. What's the recovery like after an exploit? Is it either automatic, does it require user interaction, or is it irrecoverable? Those are metrics that are important for a vulnerability. They've got one called value density, which is basically if an attacker exploits the issue once, what is like the breadth, the blast radius of their impact? An example would be an attack that uh, impacts only a single user mailbox versus an attack that uh, compromises an entire mail server. That would be the difference between diffuse for the single mailbox or concentrated for the whole server. Um, vulnerability response effort. So what's the difficulty by the consumer to actually respond and mitigate or resolve the vulnerability? Like this would take into account how difficult is it for you to install an update on the system? Is it pretty easy like a Firebox where you literally go in there and hit a button and it downloads and installs it? Or are you gonna have to like reconfigure the whole thing after deploying an update if you can even go get one onto the system in the first place? And then finally, they've got an option for like us as vendors to go in and set a what's called a provider urgency which is like our own kind of, I guess, subjective, but hopefully graded off of objective, uh, objective elements of like, what's the urgency for you as the consumer to go out and resolve this issue? It's like, yes, maybe it is a 9.0 out of 10 severity vulnerability, but maybe our opinion is like the actual chance of someone exploiting this, the risk for it is low enough. And so maybe it's just a green level urgency. You have some time to go fix it because there's other mitigating circumstances. I really like this. Like, I like all these additional metrics that they're adding in to just give additional options to get a more accurate score. Like, it's still going to be a 0, .0 out a 10 out of 10.0 score. But by looking at this string now of all of the different metrics that went into it, you as the responder or the cybersecurity engineer that's trying to resolve the issue or figure out if you need to even spend time doing it, gives you a bit more like ammo and a bit more context on how to handle these, these vulnerabilities. So I like it. Um, I know we've already started the ball rolling internally to update the uh, our pcert.watchguard.com page to reflect this new scoring model since it is official now at this point. Um, but I don't know, Corey, thoughts? Anything you hate about it? Or are you fully on board with these updates as well too? I'm 100% on board. I, I will say uh, other than maybe people like you or me that have to <laughs> run and piece or with no one knows all those numbers that have or the extra parenthetical letters that you can put behind the cvss but the fact that for for the normal user just know that that score you have is probably going to be even more relevant and, and more correct to the vulnerability and it might be harder there has been some pushback that sometimes companies can make flaws seem less severe by doing things with the calculator that are actually not lies, <laughs> you know, 
perfectly valid data but but make things appear safer than they are or things appear more dangerous than they are when they wouldn't be if you had things like the requirements for the vulnerability so overall i just think that the nutshell takeaway is the scores will be more relevant than ever before it certainly won't hurt it but there's still that caveat that this is the severity for that specific vulnerability. And there are always other mitigating circumstances that you still have to take into account when you're trying to prioritize what to respond to. But at least this can be one big factor that you can look into when trying to address your vulnerabilities that you have. Um, so the last story I want to share, this one, we had one of our team members post it today. And... My immediate response to this one, kind of like our first story was, well, that's probably BS. But in the case of this one, it is entirely possible that this is potentially true. Um, so a By the way, you're not computer... the only one in the community that thinks that. But I, I think the big difference is the person sharing this is, is not unknown. Now, so there's a quantum computing researcher named Ed Gurk who posted a message on LinkedIn like today as of this recording, or I guess a couple days ago. Uh, claiming, quote, quantum computing has become a reality. We broke the RSA 2048-bit key. Uh, so before we dive into Mark's crappy failed calculus version of quantum computing uh, and mathematics, uh, let's first like real quick refresh on RSA cryptography. It all revolves around generating two extremely large prime numbers. Uh, where when you multiply them together, it's really computationally easy. Like a computer can multiply two numbers together instantly, but it's extremely difficult to recover the two prime numbers from that resulting number. Um, so at a you know very small example, you know multiply three prime number three times five to get to fifteen. Like that's an easy computation, but your computer has to effectively brute force its way through all of the possible factors for fifteen to figure out what those two original primes were. And when you're talking about keys that are 2048 bits long, like those prime numbers get so astronomically large that it can take potentially trillions of years for a classical computer to brute force its way through and recover those two prime numbers. Uh, another word that you'll hear for this, it's called a trapdoor algorithm. I think it's really easy to fall through a trapdoor, but very difficult to climb your way back out of it without uh, Otherwise help. called a one-way algorithm. You also hear one-way hashes, and it's the same concept. Uh, very easy to, to do the mathematical computation one way, but not in the reverse. Yep. So with quantum computing, this kind of throws a wrench into the whole system. So with a classical computer... You know, every single bit, it's either on or off. It's a one or a zero as it's doing mathematical computations, like as it's trying to brute force its way to find the prime numbers. Quantum computing, it takes advantage of quantum mechanics, which I'm not even going to pretend like I can explain thoroughly. Um, but basically, it allows all of these quantum bits to exist both in a on or off state simultaneously. It, yeah, I, let's not even try to the, describe the real quantum. The, the key thing that I think everyone can understand is a normal computer has two bits, like it only calculates two bits at a time, or, or a, a field can only be one of two things is what I should say. And while you can add lots of different things together, make it a 64-bit computer, it can only have two possible answers, which limits how, how many computations a 64-bit computer can do at one time. Uh, but with quantum, the big thing about quantum is the, the thing you're measuring is more than two states. It's at least three states. And I think in quantum, there's like seven states. But so suddenly this one area that could only be two things can be three or four or whatever. Now you that just allows way more calculations with the same amount of bits, if that makes any, you know, this is the not quantum's mathematically accurate description, but at a high level, each state just has way more options than it did with normal binary computing. And that means more power. And then when it comes to measuring those states, instead of measuring it on or off, you basically get a probability of what the given state is as you're trying to you know, complete mathematics on this and get the actual result out of it. And the end result is it makes it easier, way easier to factor prime numbers. In fact, so it was 1994, there was a mathematician, Peter Shore, developed Shore's algorithm, which basically it describes how a quantum computer 
could factor an integer significantly faster than classical computers. But there's always been this limitation where Shor's algorithm requires a large number of quantum bits or qubits in order for it to work in a practical application on like an RSA 2048 bit key. Uh, where we're at right now with quantum computers, I think IBM's at like several hundred qubits. It was like 300 something last I checked. For Shor's algorithm, you'd need on the order of thousands or tens of thousands of qubits in order to uh, quickly or accurately factor a 2048-bit key. And so we're still quite a ways off. We're getting closer. Like I remember when it was the dozens of qubits, and that was amazing. Um, we're getting close enough that you know, we're starting to see quantum resistant cryptography algorithms being not just developed, but adopted as well, too. But like up until this Teams post or this uh, LinkedIn post, like the general understanding was we're still pretty far off. Um, but so Girk in his post, he said, quote, uh, QC, which stands for quantum computing. Uh, so QC computations in this case uh, were done in a commercial cell phone or a commercial Linux desktop at the capital cost of $1,000, no cryogenics or special materials were used, which is my first kind of red flag in that, like, How do you do QC like computations on a commercial cell phone? Cell phone? It's it just this, I, I, so I could be wrong, and I hope I'm wrong, because this would be a mathematical miracle and pretty awesome. It just smells totally like BS to me. But it's coming from someone that's at least well-regarded in the industry, so it's like, it's tough to just write it off entirely uh now and he has like posted an abstract too mm -hmm. like he's 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 they're doing the normal peer-reviewed thing but i think there's a comment I, ho I hope i'm not jumping too far ahead but there's a comment where one person said well why can't we read it and he mentioned well there's publication delays that are not under my control exactly to, yep. to me that is, is interesting <laughs> uh, you know i i one thing you could imagine is if it is real and he is about to publish it, uh, people in power may want to, you know, stop it because as soon as it's out, it changes things. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Um, so maybe this is him whistleblowing on his own research. Who knows? But mm -hmm. so there were like, we're not the only ones that just our BS alarm is just going off a tiny little bit on this one. Like there were people replying to his post basically saying, here's a public key and a encrypted private key. If you can crack the encryption using your fancy little system and then sign a message using that private key, then I'll believe you. Um, there were you know, folks saying, until I see them actually factor a arbitrary 2048-bit key, then you know, it's tough to believe it. And I, that's exactly where I'm at right now. Like This is potentially amazing and will completely turn encryption in our cybersecurity world on its head immediately, if it's true. But it just... It, it, I, I don't think that we are that close to it actually being reality, but it certainly felt the long. I mean, we'll be up front since this won't be a prediction, but every year we've been looking at quantum computer predictions because of encryption. And it, it felt like IPv6 to me before it's something we should be thinking about and it's coming, but it felt far away. So it will be interesting to see the result of this. And so like we are as a, industry thinking about it. The NSA developed what they're calling the Commercial National Security Algorithm Suite uh, 2.0, which is a set of quantum resistant algorithms uh, approved for uh, national cybersecurity. Um, they have a timeline for when the from the federal government on when organizations must support and then exclusively use them. And the timeline is on the order of by 2025, for the most part, you need to support it. And by 2030, it needs to be the exclusive suite of algorithms you use. Funny enough, there is like a kind of counter field to this where I've seen recent accusations that NIST is like intentionally inserting backdoors into some of these algorithms that could allow the US That's spying never agency. happened before. <laughs> exactly. By the way, it has. It's, <laughs> correct. <laughs> it's, it's tough to trust the NSA Period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I, I, there's no clause to that. It's trust. It's tough to trust the NSA, especially when they're ones the developing the security algorithms we're trying to use. I, we're and when we're, not we're being, on like, their team open. because we're in this country, so I, yeah. I I like them being smart. But yes, they they seem to spy domestically too, uh, under guise of their mission. I mean, maybe it's not a guise; it's part of their mission. But that kind of unchecked. 
power needs to be checked. Yeah. And so no backdoors without the world knowing. (laughs) I guarantee the NSA is currently developing their own quantum computer and who knows where they're at with the full funding of the federal government behind them as well, too. Um, So like the I think my takeaway from this, I think, you know, we are probably closer than we think we are to quantum computing being a reality enough that it breaks some of the encryption methods we've been relying on for so long. I don't think that day is today. Uh, And I think we're still a little bit off. I'm very interested in seeing this report. My guess is going to be they probably they potentially did actually succeed, but I'm betting it's like under a very specific set of circumstances and it's not repeatable across like the entirety of the Internet and RSA encryption. That's my prediction for this. Every time I've seen us hit this point, some researcher will find some type of attack that takes the huge astronomical factor of how hard it would be to crack and cuts it in half or something like that. But cutting it in half is still a huge enough astronomical factor that you're like, okay, now it's not a thousand years away. Now it's a hundred years away. Okay. Now it's not a hundred years away. It's 25 years away. So I, I am at least hoping that there's truth to everything that's been said here. But then when we see the detail, we might hear it's a weakness that that makes it quite a bit weaker but maybe we have more time i guess we'll see yep. i guess we will see and who knows maybe the time this episode airs we'll have the full paper out and Corey and i can be wrong and maybe encryption is now broken and we are just all totally screwed who knows uh, by the way one thing you, you should we should think about i think it was covered in the article we both read uh i and i was just randomly thinking about it this could start all kinds of new legal cases from U.S. governments and other governments. Because one thing I do not put a past a lot of technically advanced governments is packet sniffing all the existed encrypted traffic happening right now in any case they have, whether it's a criminal case against Russian ransomware folks or whether it's pirates hiding behind VPNs. Maybe they can't crack that yet, but they could be packet sniffing it because everyone knows that one day the cryptography will become too weak and now they can go back and look at communications from 10 years ago and have new evidence so i i don't think people fully realize that uh, if someone was smart enough to hold on to packet sniff communications that were encrypted when these things change a lot of new things could come out yeah, I I don't think the U.S. government is doing it to all internet traffic. Oh like, no, yeah, they've no, got a lot I, of money. I don't mean all of it. Yeah, that would but be a huge. I could absolutely. I think there's a very big reason that we've got an NSA outpost on Hawaii, right on top of a bunch of undersea cables, uh, yeah. because there are circumstances where they probably are uh, saving and a I, whole lot of traffic. I, I would assume for any active case where they wanted to see something and they were able to intercept traffic but not crack it, they at least for the cases they had running, they might have saved that for a rainy day or the opposite of a rainy day. <laughs> yeah, man, I, I don't really be a do criminal. need to try and don't be a criminal. And I'm going to go <laughs> try and pass math again so I can understand what the heck quantum computers actually are, because it's still I, all just witchcraft to me. And you're the young guy, dude. I don't. It took forever to understand binary and machine language and with just two damn bits quantum ouch my head hurts just thinking about the study i but can't imagine seems how like something we need to do for you Corey, to uh understand computers themselves when they were first invented 80 years ago <laughs> shut up <laughs> Hey, everyone. Thanks again for listening. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. If you have any questions on today's topics or suggestions for future episode topics, or if you want to tutor me on quantum computing, you can reach out to us on Twitter or X or whatever. I'm at XORRO underscore. Corey is at SecAdept. And the both of us are at hashtag the 443 podcast. Thanks again for listening, and you will hear from us next week. Like, rate, review. Do the hokey pokey and turn yourself around. That's what it's all about. Smash that like button.